Walk in the woods, you know I'm here. When a chickadee lands near, chickadee dee dee, the cry of a loon echoes in the night. A call so bright and clear. Oh, wilderness, how sweet the sound. My spirit soars today. You will hear me when the lone wolf howls. I won't be far away. We love you, Dave. That was Bart Kohler, a.k.a. Johnny Sagebrush, longtime friend and co-founder of Earth First. He wrote these words to the tune of Amazing Grace in the last days of Dave Foreman's life. Over the last week and for a long time to come, countless activists, scientists, naturalists, authors, professors, river rats, and supporters from around the world remember how Dave Foreman first inspired them to fight for the wild. I met Dave in Albuquerque 27 years ago, and it was a meeting that changed my life. Many who have written in to express their condolences to Dave's close friends and family are saying the same. Dave didn't just light a fire in the bellies of many of today's most accomplished and impassioned conservationists. He changed the game of conservation politics with his own strategies for getting things done for nature. That's a bit of what I'll explore today on the 96th episode of the Rewilding Earth podcast, another of the many projects inspired by Dave, saying goodbye to our leader, our mentor, our hero, Dave Foreman. Dave Foreman was many things to many people. His enemies have, for decades, painted him as a dangerous enemy of progress. What most people don't know beyond the headlines is that he had a full and rich career in conservation leadership and scholarship. For instance, he was a brilliant strategist when it came to organizing and winning tough battles for nature, and he taught many conservation leaders his tactics over the years. One example comes from his Around the Campfire number 38, entitled Five Little Birds and Their Lessons. He came up with the piece as he recovered from an injury at home, spending a lot of time observing the birds in his backyard habitat. This piece is a perfect illustration of how Dave taught us anything. He always tied his lessons to wildlife and nature for maximum impact and retention, and it worked. Dave wanted us all to continue his work, and over the years left many breadcrumbs for us to follow, to be inspired by, and to give us longevity in the fight to protect and restore wild places for wild critters everywhere. In the last few days, close friends called and said their goodbyes. Dave, we each found out later, was giving his last wishes redundantly to some extent, surely to cover the bases and make sure things got done, like a brilliant strategist would, all to carry on the work, always reminding us where we as conservationists came from, for us to use what he taught us to win for nature. Here I'll read what Dave had to say about five little birds and their lessons. I paraphrase here for time and encourage you to download the entire campfire number 38 at rewilding.org slash birds. Five Little Birds and Their Lessons Ten years ago, at the end of a three-week trip in Argentinian Patagonia and the rain-soaked, glacier-whittled southern Chilean coast, I took a nasty fall. After flying home to New Mexico, my back, which had never bothered me before, grew steadily worse over the coming months. I soon had to stop running six miles a day and cut back sharply on the weight machine. Then I had to give up my greatest love, backpacking, and I haven't been able to hoist a pack onto my back for nine years now. Though my days as a wilderness trekker seem gone thanks to fusion surgery, strong pain meds, shoving from my wife Nancy, 
and some help from my friends, foremost John Davis. I've done several long raft and canoe trips in the Southwest and in Arctic Alaska and Canada. Nancy and I have begun to scuba dive. Nonetheless, most of my time is spent working in the living room recliner where our feathered friends who visit our bird bath and spread of feeders endlessly enthrall our fluffy black cat, Gila, and me. I've tallied 61 species in and over our yard. I cannot overstate how thoroughly I need and love these birds. They are the wild things without which I would not want to live. Thanks to my living room birding blind, I've gotten to know some birds and who they are well. They have taught me much, five birds most of all, and I think that they can teach my fellow cannots much too. A cannot is one like Aldo Leopold, who wrote that there were some who can live without wild things, and others, like him, who cannot. You will see that these birds are not those often held up as beacons of certain values such as eagles or owls, nor are they bright flashes of many-hued loveliness such as orioles and hummingbirds. But in their behavior and mood, they are anything but drab. As I've gotten to know them better, their true grit fairly blazes. So let's meet them and hear their tweets of wisdom. Bush tit, grassroots. Bush tits are tiny, drab, and gray, but lively, lovable, and winsome in a way that springs out. They move through our neighborhood in a throng of 25 or so, swarming into a pinion tree and cleaning it of bugs and caterpillars. Then zoom, they're off in a straggling, chattering rush of another tree without a blatant leader. They are not seed eaters, but pack predators. Were they raven-sized, bush tits would be the fright of the earth. I've had wonderful meetings with wildeors from leopards to wolves in sprawling deep wilderness over the world. In the summer of 2010, I narrowly dodged being trampled and gored by a cranky bull muskox on the banks of the Noatak River above the Arctic Circle. But one of my greatest wildlife run-ins was that same summer in my yard with a bush tit. I was watering a little patch of Rocky Mountain pin stemmons and went to scoot the sprinkler to a dry spot. As I lifted the hose with the sprinkler head drizzling down, I glimpsed a sudden flash of gray from a nearby New Mexico locust. I looked down and there was a bush tit winsomely perched on my toe and showering under the sprinkler. It fluffed and fluttered and flapped its wings for half a minute and then flew off. I was in wild bliss for what was left of the day. As I wrote, bush tits have no out-and-out -out leader. For all I know, some grandma and grandpa may show leadership now and then thanks to knowledge, age, or wisdom but overall their might is in the flock. They teach the strength of grassroots work. Historian Stephen Fox sees two traditions in conservation, amateur and professional. These pathways are not split by whether or not one is paid to do conservation work, nor do they have anything to do with how good one is. The cleavage is in feeling, with amateurs working for wild things out of love and professionals working to manage land and resources because it's their job. Some of us who have worked for conservation outfits all our lives are yet amateurs, such as Bruce Hamilton, the Associate Executive Director of the Sierra Club. And there are those who have worked all their lives for a government agency who are also in the amateur pathway, such as Dave Parsons, who was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service team leader for the Mexican Wolf Reintroduction. And, alack, too many heads and staffers of nonprofit conservation outfits are in the professional camp these days. It's not whether you have a button-down job or not, it's why you do it. Cannots are truly amateurs. Just as cannots need to hew to the amateur pathway, conservation outfits should think of themselves as clubs or teams of like-minded folks, not as institutions or corporations, though they might be legally set up as such. And for those blessed to be paid by a conservation outfit, wild things should come before one's career, job, or the organization for which one works. As folk conservationists in the Cannot Club, let us be a flock of bush tits. Western Scrub Jay, Vision. The corvid family, jays, crows, and ravens are the smartest birds, and the western scrub jays might be the smartest of all. Their recall is staggering. A scrub jay knows where it is hidden upward of a thousand nuts. It goes beyond sheer recall, however. Research shows they also have a so-called theory of mind, which means they understand that other beings also think, that there are minds other than one's own. Such studies have found that when a scrub jay hides a nut, but knows another jay is watching, it will go back later and put the nut in another hiding spot when the other jay isn't watching. I put out peanuts for the four jays in my yard and have watched them do this trick. 
They not only have to watch to see if one of the other Jays sees where they hide the peanut, they also have to watch for curve build thrashers who gladly scarf up on Jay hidden goodies. There are thousands of peanuts hidden all over my yard, some in the most outlandish spots. I wonder what my neighbors think when they find a peanut stashed in a lawn chair. Scrub jays are smart, strategic, far-sighted, and visionary. We can learn much from them. A blend of paths to keep wild things is good, but all of them, from that of the Sierra Club to the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, need to be steered by thoughtful strategy. Key gains in wilderness and wildlife keeping have come from great visions. The 1980 Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act gave us more than 100 million acres of national parks, national wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, and wild rivers. Thousands of canots from all over the United States put in many hours of work on the bill, building support for it and lobbying their members of Congress. Behind all that hard, slogging grassroots work, though, was the daring and wonderful vision that began with a handful of women and men who knew well the wilderness of Alaska. Likewise, bringing back wolves to Yellowstone National Park came from much grunt work both in federal agencies and wildlife clubs. Before the work, though, was the foresight and boldness of a few who saw the need to bring wolves back to the wilderness from which they'd been killed out 70 years earlier. One vision, of which I've been proud to be a player, is that of the Wildlands Project, now called Wildlands Network. When we began in 1992, we called for networks of national parks, wilderness areas, state parks brought together by wildlife movement linkages, or wildways. We also called for putting back big wild hunters such as wolves and big cats, owing to the scientific research showing that without top carnivores, ecosystems crumble. This vision, which came to be called rewilding, was shunned and put down at first, even among many conservation biologists. But now it is the wanted path on all continents, among government agencies, scientists, and grassroots conservationists alike. True, it is not always carried out or carried out well, but the vision just a few of us had 20 years ago has taken hold. Let us be then like scrub jays. Think, plan ahead, have a vision. Curve Build Thrasher, Toughness. Curve billed thrashers are among my most loved earthlings. Their orange eyes and madcap way they run about on the ground notwithstanding, they have a loftiness and steadfastness to them that cows me. It cows the other birds in our neighborhood too. Though jays, robins, and doves outweigh them, thrashers are the boss birds. They own our yard. I put both peanuts and sunflower seeds in one small tray feeder outside my front window in the winter. I watch it while drinking my first cup of coffee and petting my lap cat, Blue. There might be four brassy jays swooping in and out with peanuts to grab and hide, but when the curve-billed thrasher sets in to munch sunflower seeds, scrub jays sit back and wait. Curve-billed thrashers are tough and won't be shoved aside. We need to learn that better. Sometimes I get a feeling that conservationists are almost apologizing for asking for what we want. We should never be shy or afraid. We in the Cannot Club are on the most righteous mission in the world, to care for other earthlings, to let them live their lives in their wild neighborhoods, and not to be elbowed off our blue-green ball of rock and water by our greed and short-sightedness. In the United States, we Cannots have come up with the best tools in the world for keeping other earthlings hale and hearty. They are national parks, the National Wilderness Preservation System, and the Endangered Species Act. We should never back away from our best tools for shielding Earth's wild things. We shouldn't switch them or water them down for new fads or political, cultural nudging. We need to stand up for what is right with the same pluck as that of the curve-billed thrasher. Ladder-backed woodpecker, doggedness. I once watched a ladder-back woodpecker in our yard drill into a tree trunk for 30 minutes until she got what she was after. These little woodpeckers work harder than any bird I know. They are dogged. When they hear or otherwise know a beetle or grub is under bark or in the wood of a branch, they keep pecking away at it. If one drill hole doesn't reach their prey, they hammer away at their target from another. They don't just dumbly keep pounding their heads against a trunk. They stop and cock their heads to see or hear if they are on the right track. They shift if they need to, but they doggedly keep at it. It should be the same for us. If one path doesn't work, try another, but never back away from warding wilderness and wildeers. It took Howard Zahnheiser eight years to get Congress to pass the Wilderness Act. 
Polly Dyer, now in her 90s, is still working after 60 years to get more wilderness areas and national parks in the North Cascade Mountains in Washington. I'm a whippersnapper. I've worked on getting some wilderness areas for only 40 years and haven't given up. We lovers of wild things win against mightier foes time and again thanks to sticking to it. Owing somewhat to the world of speedy computers on which we now depend, many conservationists expect things to happen quickly. And I see it all the time with foundations backing wilderness clubs. They have no patience, no understanding that it can take years to get a wilderness area bill passed by Congress. They hound the clubs they fund wanting new wilderness areas in each state every two years. Some funders don't seem to realize how long it takes to build a constituency for a wilderness, how long it takes to sidetrack local foes. Badgering from some funders leads even the best to cut quick and questionable deals to get any wilderness bill passed to make the foundation happy. This peevishness, this lack of knowledge about the need for long-haul, dogged work is a tide I see in conservation that undercuts real gains and plays into the hands of members of Congress who don't want to fight hard battles. Land scalpers are learning that slowing down a wilderness area bill for a few years will often lead funders and conservation outfits to lose interest in it. Had this been the case in the 1950s, I don't know if Howard Zonizer would have been given the eight years it took to get a good Wilderness Act passed and signed by the president. The best conservationists are like ladderback woodpeckers. We never, never give up. Mountain Chickadee, own sake. I've never heard anything happier or merrier than a chickadee dee dee. When these snazzy little gray birds with the sharp black stripe through their eyes show up and tell all the world, chickadee dee dee, we are here, we are the chickadees. I can't help but smile and chickadee dee dee back at them. Mountain chickadees have a good time. Why? Because they live for themselves. They don't see themselves as a mirthful show for me. They don't see themselves as any kind of good or help for man. No. They are chickadees, and that is all they need to be to answer for their lives and what they do. And so, the mountain chickadees popping into and out of our winter neighborhood carry the most worthwhile teaching for all of us. They believe they are good in themselves. We do not need to weave complex ethical theories on how wild things might have inherent value. Chickadees tell us so. Chickadees laugh in our mugs at the outlandish goal that only we, the upright ape, can give something worth. Chickadee dee dee. It means the wild things have worth for their own sake. And when we sing back, chickadee dee dee, it means we have the wisdom, the generosity of spirit, and the greatness of heart to let beings be. I think rewilding the idea that we can not just keep what we have, but make it bigger and better and wilder might be a key element in inspiring people to say, we don't have to put up with the continued crash of wildlife species, continued exploitation of wild places, the continuing spread of people everywhere, 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 of greater and greater acreages being ripped out of tropical rainforests, ripped out of wild grasslands or deserts, and turned into farm fields. Rewilding may be its greatest value is for inspiration that we can do better. We can make the situation with the world, with life, with the tree of life that we have become wilder and more whole. That we can return species to healthy populations and have them be in more parts of their natural range. We don't have to put up with the constant bad news of fewer and fewer tigers. Fewer and fewer places for lions. Fewer and fewer wild places in Utah that aren't industrialized with mines and coal mines and oil and gas drilling. That may be the great 
value of the rewilding concept is to give people hope that together we can make things better. Dave Foreman left us with a vast body of work from which to draw insight, inspiration, strategy, and energy for the fight ahead. And that's what he wanted us to do. Continue the fight to protect, connect, and restore wildlands and waters with every tool and tactic available to us, just like he showed us to the end. I encourage everyone to start with Dave's Around the Campfire articles at rewilding.org slash campfire. Finally, be sure that you join the Rewilding mailing list to keep up on the Rewilding Institute's work on all fronts going forward and share his work at rewilding.org with others so that it may speak to them as it has to you and we can carry on Dave's work for the wild. Paddle forward. Thanks for listening to the Rewilding Earth podcast. We do what we do because of you. This podcast is supported by listeners like you who long to live in a wilder world. Please consider donating at rewilding.org and subscribe to our weekly news and article digest while you're there. To go the extra mile, you can follow and share Rewilding Earth on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Bonus points for sharing this podcast with your friends. To listen to past episodes, go to rewilding.org slash pod. That's rewilding.org slash pod.